Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to see so many people made it here after yesterday. Um, yeah, I'm going to present the GPU accelerated LLP generation for point clouds. And two of my co authors, Bernhard and Philip, they're also here today. Um, they've been great help for this paper here. So the problem that we're trying to solve here is um, we have point cloud data sets with just a couple of million points up to hundreds of billions of points. And if you have um, a very large amount of points, it takes quite a while to generate an LOD structure out of that. And we wanted to figure out how fast can you do that on a GPU, because the state of the art uh, mostly revolves around doing that on a CPU for point clouds. So this is the structure that we're generating with our method. Uh, it's an octree where we have voxels in inner nodes and the original um, point cloud data in the leaf nodes. So the root node looks like this here. Uh, it's a very coarse voxel representation of the whole point cloud. Then you can uh, replace one octant of the um, uh, root node with a higher detailed child node. And at some point, if you zoom in very closely to this model, you might eventually want to render the original point cloud data which is stored in the leaf nodes. Um, it's important to note that this is that we target surface models. So even though we use voxels, um, it's not nothing volumetric. It's also not solid voxel models. It's really just the voxels on the surface of the model. Um, during the generation, we do have a sampling grid um, with a size of 128 to the power of three voxels. But this sampling grid is only needed um, when we uh, generate uh, the, the voxels for a node, and then it's discarded right away afterwards. Instead, we store the voxels in a vertex buffer uh, using their coordinates and their color values. Also, uh, during rendering, we're targeting rendering about pixel-sized voxels. So what you see here is not really what you get for rendering, because the voxels are just one pixel large, or maybe two times two pixels, if you need some more rendering performance. So uh, let's have a look at some state-of-the-art things. Um, to the left, the point clouds, uh, it's um, a structure, a binary tree where we have subsets of points in each of these nodes. So for example, a random subset uh, with uh, about 500 to 8,000 points per node, and there are no duplicates. So when you combine all the points in all nodes, you get back the original data structure. Um, this is fast to generate, also quite fast to render. There's only one problem, you don't have, uh, you don't have redundancy, um, which means you don't have representative data in inner nodes. Vandedal have addressed this by um, using a, a very similar structure, but the original point clouds, they are stored in the leaf nodes, and in the inner nodes you have some quantized representation, some representative data, uh, could be points, circles, or voxels in the inner nodes. And um, there's one figure of this paper, in this case here they use uh, circles. Um, in our paper we use basically the same structure, but with voxels, or the generated structure. There's also a modifiable nested octree, uh, which is, which is kind of similar to both of them. Um, like the layered point clouds, it has no duplicate data, so all the points are distributed in, at each level of the hierarchy. It also uses a sampling grid, like the structure from Wanderdal, uh, in order to get a more uniform subsample in inner nodes. Um, and it also uses an octree. And there's the structure from uh, Kaidas et al., uh, which also uses voxels in lower levels of detail. But uh, the, uh, instead of points, they have the full resolution triangle model in the leaf nodes. So, um, state of the art in LOD construction, uh, so this kind of throughputs here. So, for example, about two and a half million to uh, 11 million points per second. So, if you have a structure with billions of points, it can still take quite a while in order to generate a level of detail structure. So, this is what we do on a GPU now to make this faster. We have our input point cloud, and the first thing we do is we split it, uh, split all the points into leaf nodes with, with at most 50,000 points. And then the next step, we populate the inner nodes, the still empty inner nodes, with voxel representations from the bottom up. Um, this is how we do the splitting um, efficiently. We use a hierarchical counting sort, and with a hierarchical counting sort, we can generate an octree with a depth of eight levels with just two iterations over all the points. And what we need for counting sort is a counting grid, and we need one counter for each potential leaf node at the highest level of the arc tree. And in our case, that means we need a counting grid with a size of 256 to the power of three. And then we count all the points of our uh, data set into the cells here. Um, yeah, once we've done the counting, we basically have our arc tree structure where we know the amount of points in the leaf nodes. The problem uh, right now is that we 
general structure that's used for rasterization. And for rasterization, we want to have uh, a certain batch size of points in a node. So if we have nodes with very few points, we then start merging these nodes into um, a lower levels of the hierarchy in order to get much, uh, larger batch sizes, uh, with the goal to have nodes with less than 50,000 points, but also not too many, too small nodes. So at some point, we have the, uh, the, the second to the right, where we merged all the points here. And this basically gives us the full octree hierarchy with knowledge about the number of points in the leaf nodes. And at that point, we can allocate the right amount of memory for each leaf node. And then we iterate a second time through all the points in order to insert them into uh, the leaf nodes. Okay, so now we have this uh, structure in the middle where we have the points in the leaf nodes, and we have to populate the empty inner nodes with voxelized representations. We do that by picking an empty node, creating a sampling grid with the size of 128, and we then add all the points and voxels from the child nodes into the sampling grid. Then we extract the voxels from the sampling grid and store them into a vertex buffer. Here's what this uh, sampling grid looks like. Uh, there are several strategies that you can use to compute the color. Um, very fast and uh, simple is the first come strategy. So the first point that hits a voxel cell um, generates a voxel, and the color from this point is used as a voxel color. Um, this is a bit of a problem because it's biased towards um, earlier points in your data set. Uh, a little better is a random strategy where you pick one random point in a voxel and uh, better than that still average and weighted uh, sampling strategies. So yeah, for the first come strategy, the nice thing is that we only need one bit per cell in the sampling grid. And this one bit tells us if this voxel is already occupied or not. And um, in the end, uh, the sampling grid for, uh, takes about 32 kil kilobytes, which fits in shared memory, and it's also one of the reasons why this is fast. If we do the random sampling, we need more bits than that. Um, in our case, we use an um, integer where we have a random number component and a component that stores the index of the point that we're adding to this voxel grid. And we then do an atomic max and uh, sample with the largest random numbers accepted. And then we can extract the um, index in there to get the sample that was accepted. At the bottom here, um, you can see what this sampling looks like. So we have some surface uh, that's mostly green, but there are some red dots in there as well. Problem with the first and the random sampling strategies is that it happens quite frequently that you uh, pick a non-representative sample here. So even though these red points are very subtle in the surface, in the voxelized representation, they are um, too visible. So with the average strategy, that gets a little better. Uh, you average all the points within the cell. But there's still a problem that if the surface doesn't nicely intersect or barely intersect with a voxel, then we might end up picking an unsuitable point here. And with the weighted average strategy, we take into consideration, into consideration all the points in the vicinity of the voxel, including points in neighboring voxels. And then we weight your color by the distance. Um, of course, we also want to make this um, parallel here on the GPU. So what we do is, when we have this structure where we have all the points in the leaf nodes, the first thing you do now is we create a list of all the bottommost nodes um, that are still empty. And we can uh, process each of these nodes in parallel. And we use one group, work group per node to process that in parallel on the GPU. But we also make sure that we don't spawn too many work groups, because each work group needs a sampling grid in order to voxelize uh, these nodes or create a voxel representation. And each of these uh, sample grids uh, requires 32 megabytes, so it's quite sizable. So what we do, one work group um, processes one node, and we spawn as many work groups as there are streaming multiprocessors on a GPU. And with that, we need about 2.7 gigabytes for the sampling grids on an uh, RTX 3090. And all of these work groups, they then loop through the unprocessed nodes until eventually all of the nodes are processed. So the results regarding performance uh, is we can construct this structure at a rate of about two to five billion points per second with the first um, come or the random strategy. Uh, with average strategy, it's about two billion points per second, and with the weighted average, about one billion points per second. And compared to the CPU-based state of the art, so we are about um, 80 to 400 times faster than that. Um, we benchmark one of that um, on a uh, CPU, which is an out-of-core process. So it loads data from disk and then processes it. So we benchmarked it from RAM disk in order to make sure that um, this file I.O. is not a limiting factor here. 
but yeah, about 100 times faster usually. Um, this is what is different sampling strategy uh, then produce here. So what you see are uh, already the voxels, just one pixel per voxel. And with the first and random strategy, um, they look very similar, but they have some big 80s and issues. With the average and weighting strategy, uh, both of that get better, and you can actually kind of almost read what's written in there, unlike the first two strategies. Um, the first come strategy and has a problem that is biased towards earlier points in the data set. So it can spectacularly fail in some data sets with uh, not very good ordering, where, uh, or not nice ordering for our case, where you uh, were ordered for scan position, some scan earlier, some scan later, and somehow you pick the earlier scan all the time. The random strategy makes that a little better, even better the average strategy. And um, the average strategy still has the problem that if the surface is not nicely aligned, with the voxel grid, you get some weird artifacts here, and the weighted strategy um, improves it uh, a little further. So here's a video of what the LOD structure looks like. We have these Ocri nodes here. We can reduce the level of detail. Usually if you do that, um, holes will start to appear. What you could do is render the voxels then as boxes or as quads on screen in order to fill these holes here. Here's another video that I um, just reused from last year. Uh, last year it was about rendering this kind of LOD structure fast. And uh, in this case here, this data set with 520 million points, um, it can be rendered in real time in virtual reality at 90 frames per second um, by uh, reducing the amount of points that we actually rendered thanks to the level of detail structure. So yeah, um, of course there are uh, several limitations. And one is, for example, that with the averaging, we uh, improved uh, some of the worst aliasing um, artifacts, but it's still not great. Um, also, you have to combine it with um, some blending, some high quality shading, where you blend together overlapping points, because it, uh, it's not a replacement for that. It just makes it better, because blending alone cannot produce a nice result if the blended colors are a bad um, selection. Also, uh, to make things even better, the color should um, depend on a few direction, because for example, if you do the voxel representations and uh, you create a voxel of two sides of a wall, then this wall collapses into one single voxel and you have the same color for both sides. So at some point, you, there should be something that uh, considers that and uses something like um, spherical harmonics, for example, to do the right color for the right direction. It's also not yet out of core, but um, there's really no problem to include this into an out of core process because they usually do um, some chunking first anyway, and then you could apply this on the chunks that you've generated. Also, um, it's important to note that this structure uh, is for performance. So it's you know, for handling large amounts of LiDAR data quickly, create a LOD structure quickly, render a massive geometry quickly, but it's not for quality. Um, the underlying data doesn't really allow for quality. It's just simple points with a color. Uh, there is no surface normal. There is no... Uh, extent of this kind of point, so you will get holes if you zoom in. So if you want the quality, you probably still have to use textured meshes or something like surface or Gaussian splats. There are some potential implementation improvements that you could also use. For example, um, we've used 2.7 gigabytes for the sampling grids, and there are some ways to reduce it uh, to 160 megabytes. For example, instead of 128, you could use 64 and reuse it eight times for all the ch children that you sample in a node. Also, one of the reviewers rightfully uh, remarked that um, instead of using one integer per color channel or for a counter, we could use a little less bits. For example, we could use a bit pattern of 18, 18, 18 for the colors and 10 for the counter in order to compute a sum of up to around uh, 1,000 voxels or points. And another low-hanging fruit for implementation is, of course, to quantize the, uh, the points on the voxels. Right now, we almost use 16 bytes, even for the voxels, and this is quite wasteful. Also, points in the leaf nodes, they have a very small extent, so it's also better to use some kind of uh, fixed precision integer for that. And for future work, um, right now, it really makes the processing much, much faster, but very often, you're limited by the actual file I.O. So it takes us one second to generate the LOD structure, but it might still take us 60 seconds to actually load it from disk, so you still have to wait a minute until you can view the results. So because of that, we've already been working on 
turning this into an incremental approach where data is loaded from disk, the arc tree is updated incrementally, and you can view it right away in real time. So this is where it's currently headed, but both of them have their um, use cases. The top one is much, much faster in terms of throughput, but an incremental approach uh, lets you see things right away. So yeah, with that, thank you for your attention, and if you want to take the source code, um, take a look at this link. So thanks a lot for this cool talk. Um, now we have time for questions. Are there questions? Oh, okay. Hope it's on. Hello. Wow, it's nice. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very nice. Uh, you mentioned in the limitations that you didn't do the out of core yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so may I ask, uh, what's the largest size of your testing data and what GPU you use and how much GPU memory you have? Uh, pardon, can you repeat it? Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, I'm saying, like, uh, what's the largest size of your testing uh, uh, The largest data? size we've tested since this is in-core was 1 billion points. And uh, this was on a GPU with 48 gigabytes. So we didn't really do anything memory friendly here. But if you do this in an out-of-core process, then we have data sets with, uh, for example, 6,400 billion points. So if you look at this first slide, there's actually a data set, the right rightmost one, 640 billion points, and it's from the Netherlands. And even though the resolution is just about 12 points per square meter, so it's not a really high resolution for if you wanted to do a first-person view, but still you end up with that much data, and with out-of-core you could handle that. Memory or? Uh, no, uh, what you'd have to do is, for example, to do a um, first pass where you create chunks and then you process each chunk um, and you could process each chunk on the GPU, write the results back on disk, and at some point combine all the uh, individual, basically individual arc trees that you generated, combine them into one large arc tree. So that's one way to do that. Is there another question? Thank you. Nice talk. Um, I wonder, could you say a few words about like potential discontinuity artifacts when switching from the voxel to the point representation? Um, so if you use the, uh, the blending, then discontinuity, it's barely visible. It can happen, but barely visible. The bigger problem is also not the color discontinuity, the, the, the geometric discontinuity, because we don't really know how, far, uh, how large these points should be. They don't have a size. So what can happen is that you might uh, see some popping artifacts uh, as additional level of detail is um, added and rendered. But yeah, that's a problem that's kind of difficult to solve uh, without doing some really um, processing of the neighborhood, create circles maybe or something like that. Any other questions? Then maybe one from me. Um, you said you add 50,000 points to your leaf nodes. Why exactly 50,000? Uh, it's kind of a magic number. It worked out nicely that way. Okay. Um, also, uh, one of the reasons is because this voxel grid, the size, 128, um, it produces, on average, about 20 to 30,000 voxels per um, node. And uh, if we have a maximum size of 50,000 points per leaf node, then the average also ends up about being the same. So it's just that the leaf nodes have the aver same average size as the inner nodes. OK, thanks. So are there any more questions? Otherwise, I would like to thank Markus for this great talk.